Happy Thursday morning to you. I'm Ronnie Dell alongside Tyler Keith. The governor is just now starting her press conference, and we want to bring you the latest as to what she has to say on COVID-19 here in the state of Michigan. Labor and Economic Opportunity Department, Jeff Donofrio, Andrea Acevedo, the president of SEIU Healthcare Michigan, John Walsh, the president of the Michigan Manufacturers Association, Rachel Hurst, the corporate affairs manager for Kroger, and Russ Cavaluna, the president of Henry Ford College. We've got a number of people to speak today, so I'm gonna keep my remarks short, but we will get to Q&A at the end. So. Right now, Michigan is serving as a model for our Midwestern neighbors and states across the country when it comes to fighting COVID-19. Even as we continue to ramp up testing, which we are doing at about 30,000 a day, which is quite a remarkable feat, our positivity has dropped. And here you can see our daily cases per million are lower than Midwestern states, all of our colleagues around us in the Midwest, and uh, Texas is plotted on this as well. And you can see Michigan is leading. As you also can see here, our testing has risen rapidly. We are far above many other states, and the key to understanding this virus and keeping people safe is this ramping up of testing. And so we should be very proud we're doing over 30,000 per day now. So the aggressive action that we have taken over the last six months is working. But as always, we've got to remain vigilant. And that means continuing to wear our masks and practice safe physical distancing and doing everything in our power to protect ourselves, our families, our frontline workers, our most vulnerable populations, and our economy. Over the past six months, Michiganders across the state have put their lives on the line every single day to protect others from this deadly virus. Home and congregate care health workers have been taking care of elderly patients, janitors and custodians who have been working in our hospitals, grocery store workers who have been stocking the shelves so the rest of us can put food on the table, postal workers who show up every day and deliver our mail and our prescription drugs and our ballots. These men and women have emerged as the real heroes in the midst of this pandemic. And yet we know it's a lot more important that we act and treat them as the heroes they are, not just call them heroes. So we've got to work around the clock to ensure that long after this crisis is over that our frontline workers have the support they need to get ahead in our country. Support whether it is dealing with PTSD from especially those who've been on the front lines caring for people who've been battling COVID-19, with people that have been showing up and putting their own health on the line to make sure the rest of us can stay safe. And so that's why today we are launching Michigan's Futures for Frontliners program. Historically, when Americans put their lives on the line for our country, the betterment of our country, to defend us from a common enemy, a grateful nation has afforded them some educational opportunities to show our gratitude. This is what motivated the GI Bill uh, during President Franklin D. Roosevelt's term. He signed it into law during World War II to provide tuition to veterans to attend high school or get their post-secondary degree. It was a path to success for people that sacrifice for our country. In April, I announced a similar plan to honor the people who stayed on the front lines throughout this COVID-19 funded by the governor's emergency education relief. Fund, part of the CARES Act funding. Tuition-free access to get an associate degree or an industry-recognized occupational certificate is a chance for thousands of people to get on a path to a good job that will support themselves and their families. 
having a few technical difficulties, just getting the governor's audio, but it's an important conversation that we want to bring you. Again, she's starting off her press conference talking about support for frontline workers, saying that the future is in our hands. They've sacrificed for the state of Michigan and for all of us here in Michigan. The press conference just getting underway. We're going to take a quick break here on the Oakland County Megacast. And when we come back, we're going to try to log back in and, and get you the rest of the governor's press conference uh, here. Uh, but uh, again, we're just going to take a quick break here on the Oakland County Megacast. Governor Gretchen Whitmer speaking about support for frontline workers on the Oakland County Megacast. Hi, I'm Dr. Faust the medical director for the Oakland County Health Division. The most important thing you can do to prevent the spread of illness is to wash your hands thoroughly and often. Follow these six easy steps every time you wash your hands. Step one, turn on the sink and wet your hands with warm water. Step two, apply soap to your hands and lather between your fingers, under your nails, and the front and back of your hands and wrists. Step three, wash your hands by scrubbing them together for at least 20 seconds. Step four, Rinse your hands with warm, clean water. And step five, dry your hands with a clean cloth towel, a paper towel, or hot air blow dryer. If you're using a cloth towel, make sure to change it often. For handheld faucets, turn off the water using a paper towel instead of your bare hand. Step six, if you're using a paper towel, throw it away. Practice healthy habits like washing your hands after coughing or sneezing into them to keep you and others healthy. Go to oakgov.com slash health or call Nurse on Call at 1-800-848-5533 to learn more. Again, we join Governor Gretchen Whitmer in her latest press conference and the response to COVID-19 here in the state of Michigan. Everyone in this room, we are going to continue to work around the clock to protect our families and frontline workers and small businesses. And with that, I will hand it over to Dr. Caldoun for an update on what we are seeing in, in the numbers and across the state. Thank you. Oh, actually, I'm going to hand it over to the Lieutenant Governor, Governor, uh, Lieutenant Governor Garland Gilchrist. <laughs> yeah, I don't have any numbers for you today, Governor. <laughs> All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, I would like to thank Dr. I mean, excuse me. There we go. We're, we're exchanging this here. Uh, Governor Whitmer, Dr. John A. Caldoun, uh, I want to also recognize uh, Director Donna Frio and our guests here for today's uh, announcements. Uh, Andrea Acevedo from SCIU Healthcare, uh, Rich, uh, excuse me, Rachel Hurst, uh, John Walsh, and Russ Cavaluna. Thank you so much for your leadership and what you provide to our communities and to our state. I want to begin today, however, by really uh, addressing the people of Michigan and saying thank you. Thank you for stepping up and for standing tall for all of us by taking this virus seriously. We are a state that respects science. We are proud of the tremendous educational, research, scientific, and medical institutions that we have built in this state throughout our state's history. And as the governor alluded, we're doing better, frankly, than a lot of other states because you took this virus so seriously. You listened to the experts, and you put the health and safety of your fellow Michiganders first. You don't have to take my word for it, actually, because as we talked about uh, last week, uh, President Trump's own coronavirus task force co coordinator, Dr. Deborah Burks, praised the state of Michigan's people for their efforts to slow the spread and battle COVID-19 when she visited our state last week. So let's continue to mask up Michigan, and we can beat this disease. Today marks six months since Michigan recorded our state's first uh, COVID-19 cases. It was in those early days that we realized just how many heroes, these unsung heroes, that we actually have in our communities, oftentimes working day in and day out to make our lives easier and safer. The Futures for Frontliners program is a national model, a first of its kind down payment on our debt of gratitude to these brave women and men who stayed on the front lines during this pandemic. Because of their work, so many Michiganders were able to stay home and stay safe, which helped tremendously mitigate the spread of COVID-19. Now it is our turn to help them by providing a tuition-free pathway to a post-secondary education. You know, one of my favorite quotes on education is by the Swiss psychologist uh, Jean Pierre, who wrote, 
the goal of education is not merely to increase the amount of knowledge, but to create the possibilities for a person to invent and discover, to create people who are capable of doing new things. The reality is there are people all across this state who are looking to further their education by increasing and expanding their skills. We want to support their pursuits too. Governor Whitmer set a goal to get 60% of Michiganders to earn a post high school degree or certification in the next 10 years. Michigan was the last state in the Midwest to set such a post-secondary attainment goal, but we do not have to let that prevent us or keep us from being one of the first states to achieve such a goal. So that is why, in addition to the Futures for Frontliners program that we are just announcing, we're also announcing an additional program to help Michiganders upscale into new careers. We are partnering with the Modern States Education Alliance and the College Board to help Michiganders earn free college credit. This $1 million contribution will help adults attain a college degree by fully funding 10,000 college level examination program credits, program exams, and pre exam coursework over the next year. Let me say this plainly and clearly this partnership will provide college credit for free. This program will save people time and money while helping them get another step closer to earning the degree or certification that paves the way for a wide range of durable and long-term employment, career, and entrepreneurial opportunities. To register for the Modern States courses, visit michigan.gov slash skills to work. And to learn more about the college level examination program, visit the College Board's website at clep.collegeboard.org. We believe that everyone should have access to the skills and career training that they need to have a chance at a good paying job or to start their own business. Governor Whitmer and I recognize that the path forward is oftentimes through additional education and training opportunities. Education is the conduit for success. It is a critical pathway in a person's life that can transform simple interests into a lifelong career and familial prosperity. But more than that, Education has the possibility to expose us to new thoughts, new ideas, and new possibilities. It's these experiences that Governor Whitmer and I want to develop and expand access to for every Michigander. I stand here before you as the Lieutenant Governor of our state because programs provided those sorts of educational and exposure experiences for me as a child and as a young adult. Because people created a pathway for me to attend college on scholarship. Just like we pave our roads with care and a vision toward enabling mobility and commerce, we must pave the pathways to potential, progress, and prosperity for all of the people of Michigan, regardless of their station in life. We are proud to progress toward this future through the Futures for Frontliners program and the College Level Examination program. So thank you, continue to mask up, and with that, I'd now like to introduce Dr. Joanne Cup. Good morning. Thank you, Governor and Lieutenant Governor. So yesterday we announced 108,595 cases and 6,552 deaths in the state due to COVID-19. As of last Friday, our seven-day state average was 55 cases per million, which is a consistent decrease over the previous two weeks. However, our percent of tests that were positive went up slightly to 3.2%. As always, regionally, we are seeing different patterns. The Detroit, Saginaw, and Upper Peninsula regions remain over 40 cases per million people. However, trends for new cases and test positivity in those areas are declining. The Grand Rapids, Jackson, and Lansing regions also have over 40 cases per million people. However, the trends for case rates and test positivity is increasing in these regions. The Kalamazoo region is also over 40 cases per million people, and while the percent of tests that are positive in that region are trending up, the case rate in the Kalamazoo region is trending downwards. The Traverse City region has the lowest case rate in the state at 27 cases per million, and they have 2.2% positivity. Currently, trends for new cases and positivity in the Traverse City region are also increasing. We continue to focus on quickly reaching out to people who test positive and understanding who their close contacts are. 
So it's important to note that over the past 30 days, approximately 19,000 Michiganders have been diagnosed with COVID-19. Local or state case investigators attempted an interview in nearly 15,000 of those cases within 24 hours of us receiving a referral for that positive test. For each positive case, we also identify their close contacts and monitor those people for 14 days to see if they develop symptoms. 99% of those contacts are reached out to within 24 hours of the health department staff getting their information. On some days, there are as many as 4,000 people who are actively being monitored for development of symptoms so we can quickly get them a test if they do. I just want to say I'm incredibly proud of our local, uh, our, our staff and our leadership of our local health departments and our team at the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. They are doing this important work seven days a week. We also continue to aggressively track outbreaks. As of last Friday, uh, there were 61 new outbreaks identified at the local health department level. That is 32 fewer than the previous week, which is a great sign. We also have 157 ongoing outbreaks across the state, and that's 65 fewer than we were tracking the previous week. Our top five categories for outbreaks are nursing facilities, manufacturing, healthcare, social gatherings, and restaurants. We will continue to watch these outbreaks very closely, and next week we will be posting information about outbreaks at schools, including colleges. I want to talk uh, and emphasize the importance of continuing vigilance as our children go back to school. Parents, please continue to emphasize with your children, even elementary school children, the importance of washing hands, maintaining distance, and wearing a mask. This is not only important for when your child is physically in school. It's important if your child or anyone in the household is going out in public. None of us lives in a bubble. When there are cases in the community, they can easily spread to our homes, to our schools, and other places. So we have to remain vigilant at all times. And the sooner that we can, by working together, bring the COVID-19 case rates down low enough, the sooner more children will be able to have in-person learning. And this is something that every parent, educator, and teacher wants. I also know, again, I'm the mother of three children, that part of the fun of childhood is having gatherings with friends and play dates. This social interaction is important for our children's well-being. I, I completely understand that. But, but please consider not having those play dates as you normally would. Try to be creative and have video conference calls with your children's friends if possible. And if you must have a gathering, try to make it as small as possible and follow the governor's executive orders. Know that outdoor is safer than indoor, but outdoor does not mean that it's 100% safe. Six feet of distance should be maintained wherever possible, and if you can't, you should wear a mask. Every time you have a gathering, there's a risk that someone there will have COVID-19. Not only could it spread to others and make people very ill, but it can also cause significant disruptions if someone is identified as a close contact and they have to stay out of school or work for two weeks. We're all in this together, and if we continue to be patient, it can avoid spread of the disease in our communities. I also want to talk about the importance of masks. Masks work. If they're worn correctly, they can decrease spread by as much as 70%. However, masks only work if you are wearing them appropriately. That means not down around your chin, not only over your mouth, but over your mouth and nose every time. Please remember this important point. If your friends, family, or coworkers are not wearing their mask appropriately, please give them a friendly reminder. We all have a role to play in fighting COVID-19. We all want to continue moving forward. So wear your mask appropriately, wash your hands, keep six feet of distance, and of course, get your flu shot this season. And with that, I'll turn it over to Director Jeff Donofrio. Thank you, Dr. Caldoun, and uh, thank you, Governor Whitmer, Lieutenant Governor Gilchrist. Really happy to be here today with our partners to talk about Future for Frontliners, but I do want to just mention one thing around COVID. Um, in the Department of Labor and Economic Opportunity, we have, of course, MIOSHA, which is ensuring workplace safety for 
workers, for customers, and for communities. And I would uh, again plug any employer out there who's looking to help understand what the rules are, understand best practices, can go to michigan.gov slash COVID workplace safety. There's a host of resources and guides and uh, a lot of different things you can download to help make sure that you keep your workplace safe. Um, it's really important to our economy, to keeping our economy running, that we keep this uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic flat and uh, de declining. Um, I want to just acknowledge our partners in business, in labor, in education, and in the legislature. They have really stepped up uh, throughout the last uh, few months and throughout the last few years in helping us bridge the gap for education. Because we know education is so important uh, to economic opportunity in this state. You know, over the last six months, we've also seen that individuals have stepped up to save lives and keep our communities operating, these frontliners. They've worked to keep hospitals running, keep water and electricity flowing. They've helped us put food on the table, and they've manufactured and delivered ventilators and masks to those on the front lines battling the pandemic. They are the heroes of our generation. 75 years ago, another set of heroes came back from the fronts of World War II, and the, the federal government provided them, through the GI Bill, an opportunity to increase their education and increase their prosperity. What was true then is even more true today. Individual and family prosperity, the opportunity to advance in a career, to live a good quality of life, continues to be highly linked to education. Those with higher education earn more money. They're less exposed to unemployment or recession. They're less exposed to changes in our economy. They're also more likely to have expanded health insurance and be healthier because of it, an important thing that we have seen during this pandemic. But pathways to higher education are oftentimes difficult, primarily for adults who have to balance the work, family, and community obligations that they have. We also know that there are significant attainment gaps that exist by race, ethnicity, income, and geography. That's why the Future for Frontliners program is so important. It's a program that provides a tuition-free path to completing college certificates and degrees in in-demand jobs. It also helps if you don't have a high school diploma. Wherever you are in life, if you're a frontliner without a college degree, we're here to help you. We're here to help you along that pathway. It's really important, but it's not the only reason that this program is important. Each year, thousands of good paying jobs, many in essential industries, go unfilled. When these jobs go unfilled, these companies that are creating these jobs lose the ability to grow and expand their businesses. Oftentimes, they look to other states to grow with more educated workforces. Programs like Future for Frontliners that will upskill thousands of Michiganders to fill these good paying jobs will change that dynamic. Employers embracing these programs, like those represented here today, will also see additional benefits. By helping their employees link education to career development, particularly in the companies and the uh, industries they're working in currently, they're closing the skills gap at home. They're also training the next generation of leaders. By supporting employees enrolled in classes with flexible schedules, with mentorship, with other wraparound support services, they're building bonds of goodwill that are going to help that team grow and be stronger. It's going to lead to lower turnover rates and higher productivity. I hope that every employer and every frontline worker are going to take advantage of this opportunity. But all of us can help. Even if we don't work in an essential industry, we know people who do. They're our friends, they're our neighbors, they're our family. Between now and December 31st, I ask you all to spread the word. Tell people to go to michigan.gov slash frontliners. Help us thank our heroes and expand opportunity here in Michigan. I also want to just, uh, again, um, thank uh, a few people who've, who've worked really hard on this program. Doug Ross, Michelle Richard, uh, Ava Atari, and Brandy Johnson. It's because of their work that uh, this program is coming to fruition today. Um, with that, I want to turn it over to our next guest speaker. Uh, and I'll let her come up to the podium. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Andrea Acevedo, and I'm the president of SEIU Healthcare Michigan. And we represent over 11,000 front county healthcare workers. When COVID hit our communities in Michigan, our frontline workers were the first responders who put their lives on the line to protect us all. I remember how afraid our workers were. We didn't have enough testing and we didn't have enough proper PPE to protect ourselves and our patients. 
Meanwhile, our hospitals and nursing homes began to pile up with COVID-19 patients. As the federal government failed to take action we, to protect us and our patients, we looked to our state for answers. That's why I'm so thankful that Governor Whitmer took swift action to protect us by shutting down the state to prevent the rapid spread of the virus. It wasn't an easy decision, but is undoubtedly the right decision. Through her leadership, I know we saved thousands of lives. By emphasizing science, Michigan is now one of the leaders in the country in the response to COVID-19. We have achieved this success through expansive testing, greater supplies of PPE, increasing hospital capacity, and allowing science to catch up to gain a better understanding of the virus. Thank you again, Governor Whitmer, for your leadership in this crisis. Now I'd like to talk about Governor Whitmer's new program, Future for Frontliners. This program will provide a tuition-free pathway to college or a technical certificate for thousands of our healthcare workers who don't currently have a college degree. Being able to get a tuition-free degree or training while on the job is a huge advantage in the changing healthcare landscape where degrees, certificates, and training is paramount in growing one's skill set. With short staffing a challenge for our workers across many medical professions, this program helps create a pipeline of talent for growing healthcare workforce. Whether you're a hospital worker or a nursing home worker, you can take advantage of this opportunity in nearly every workplace. I'm so excited for our union workers who now have the opportunity to add new skills that'll help them advance in their careers. Finally, we thank Governor Whitmer for her commitment in supporting unions in every workplace. Whether you're a frontline worker comfortable in your career or a worker looking for new educational jobs or training, you deserve a living wage and benefits such as PTO, sick time, and affordable health care. Governor Whitmer continues to stand strong with the unions and ensure that our workers are protected and safe in every workplace. Thank you. Good morning. I'm John Walsh, the president of the Michigan Manufacturers Association, and on behalf of our association and the manufacturers across the state, I'd like to thank Governor Whitmer and the Lieutenant Governor for having us here today for their leadership during this very difficult period in our state's history, and in particular for today, uh, their leadership on futures for frontliners. The MMA represents Michigan manufacturers from the UP to the southern border, from east to west. We work in every industry, not just automotive, but aerospace, agriculture, healthcare, just to name a few. We represent the largest iconic names that you might know, Ford, GM, FCA, Dow, and Kellogg. However, 80% of our members are small businesses with 100 employees or less. Truly the small business back, uh, backbone of our economy. One of the things that all of our manufacturers are looking for is skilled trades. It was a big problem before the pandemic and it's been exacerbated since the pandemic started. In response to this need, the Governor's Future for Frontliners program will address two critical needs in our industry. The first is to recognize and reward those workers who stayed on the front line, true heroes that are deserving of this investment in their future. Second, it will help upskill our workers to meet the needs of the 21st century economy. The program is flexible so that essential workers can pursue a college degree or a certificate while working earning more pay and seeking advancements in their career. And by covering the cost of tuition, the program rewards our hardworking employees so that they can be on the job and back at school at the same time. From the arsenal of democracy to our response to, the, to COVID-19, time and again, manufacturers have answered the call to action. And for this, the 600,000 Michiganders that are working in the industry deserve our praise and our thanks. Governor, it is our honor to be your partner in this battle and to be a champion for the Futures for Frontliners program. Thank you. Thanks, Governor.
Good morning. I'm Rachel Hurst, Corporate Affairs Manager for the Kroger Company of Michigan, and good morning, Michiganders. Uh, thank you, Governor Whitmer, and the entire administration for allowing us to be part of this amazing announcement today. We are honored and we are truly humbled. Since the early 1900s, Kroger has been devoted to Michigan and our economy. We have grown to employ nearly 20,000 frontline associates covering 119 stores in multiple communities across our state. Our team's unwavering commitment during these unprecedented times makes me proud to work for an amazing company. Each and every day, keeping our customers, our associates safe while stocking our shelves and continuing to provide food to our communities is what we do every day. We are excited for them to have the opportunity to continue secondary education with the support, financial support, of the Future of Frontliners program, which pairs well with our Feed Your Future program that we too offer. Through education, our state will continue to grow and prosper. Navigating through these unchartered waters over the course of the past several months has been challenging for everyone across Michigan. And again, keeping our doors open each day to feed our customers and our communities while keeping each and every person safe will remain at the core of how we operate our business every day. We are in this together. Mask up, Michigan, and thank you again. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Russ Cavaluna. I'm the president of Henry Ford College. <clears throat> uh, Madam Governor, Mr. Lieutenant Governor, <clears throat> excuse me, it's been a long time since I saw you on my campus and uh, we miss you there. Uh, it seems like a different world when we had you there. Um, there hasn't been a lot of good news since then, but I'm so excited to be here this morning because there's great news this morning. Uh, Henry Ford College, and frankly me personally, are proud to support the Futures for Frontliners program that's being discussed here today because it'll work together with public and private entities to help Michigan build its future both individually and as a collective society. We believe this is a unique, in fact, first in the nation, program that'll help people who have earned a chance to a college education. These are the people who served our Michigan citizens on front line during the pandemic. And now we are going to now put their futures at the forefront. These students who will enroll at Henry Ford College and other institutions like ours are going to look for ways to enhance their career path. They will not have time to waste. In fact, several of them are enrolled now and will be in the future and they're already working. They're taking care of their families. They're going to be doing that while they go to school. And so we are going to commit to make it worth their time. Our college, like many others, want to make sure that every single class they take is a step forward to a new career or an enhanced career. We will work hard to understand their goals and to achieve a path for them to accomplish those goals. We will assist them in financial needs, academic needs, social needs during their college experience. Now we know that these Futures for Frontliners students will have personal goals and professional goals that they'll need to educate us about. We frankly know that not one size fits all for these students. They'll be from various backgrounds and various ages, but we know that a degree or a post high school credential will make them and our society better. That's why we offer so many different academic programs and all of them are tied to closing Michigan's skills gap. These programs are candidly a path to the middle class and Michigan frontliners deserve that path. So we are committed to helping frontliners in any program, in any academic program in our college to help them in that path. And we'll support them all the way from graduation and into their new careers. Futures for frontliners is something Michigan needs, which is why we are supporting it. We look forward to working with the governor, the legislature, and our partners in industry to continue to craft programs that will move Michigan forward to help our workforce, our society, and our community. Thank you. Well, I want to thank Russ and John and Rachel and Andrea. Uh, appreciate your making time to be here with all of us and your help in 
ensuring that these pathways really are um, a reality for opportunity for so many people in our state. Um, I, I know that we are going to jump into a few questions with the press, and so I'm happy to do that. I think I just want to make a quick observation with recent developments that have happened in the last 24 hours. And we are six months into our experience with COVID-19. It's been tough, um, and almost 200,000 Americans have lost their lives to, to COVID. We have millions who are out of work, and there's still not a national strategy around masking or PPE or, or testing. Um, we know that more Americans have died from COVID-19 than World War II and the Vietnam War combined. And yesterday, on the day that we hit 190,000, exceeded 190,000 people dead in the United States, we learned uh, from some revelations from Bob Woodward that the president admitted in a tape this past February that he knew that COVID-19 passes through the air. He knew it was a lot more deadly than the flu, despite of all of the representations that have ma been made in the, the last six months. He knew then, and he purposefully downplayed it. He even said, I wanted, I wanted to always play it down. Experts say that if we'd acted just one week sooner as a nation, 36,000 people would have been saved. Two weeks sooner, 54,000 lives that would have been spared in March and April. And we know in Michigan, 6,552 people have died. So I think this failure to act has, has led, cost so many lives. It has sent our economy into a tailspin. And I'll say it's just devastating to hear that when we've been working so hard to save lives. We will not be in a state of emergency forever. And I made a comment in an interview the other day that I thought we were in the earlier phases of COVID-19. And what I meant by that is we are learning an exponential amount about this virus every single day. And I anticipate we're gonna be learning so much at such a quick clip now and in the coming months. Um, but I, I believe that this is a, a matter of months, frankly. And no one's more uh, eager to get out of a state of emergency than I. But we've had to make tough decisions throughout this process. And with a federal government that hasn't been doing it, I think it's important that so many governors have. And I thank you for the work that you've done to keep yourself safe and your family safe and your neighbors safe. And I want you to know we're in this together. We'll continue to work through it together. Michigan's shown great leadership, and we're going to get through this. Um, and and I, uh, I've got while I'm as depressed about that news that came out of Washington, D.C. in the last 24 hours, I'm, I'm more determined than ever to make sure that we do get out of this and, and we get smarter and stronger every day that goes by. So with that, I'm happy to open it up for a few questions from the press. Hey, Governor, the first question will come from Cody Butler with TV10. Good morning, Governor. So. Um, I guess can you kind of talk about more about what your reaction was when you found out that Trump purposely downplayed this for months? Well, I, I thank you for the question. I've had a lot of emotions about it, to be honest, because I've seen our nursing home workers who are already going through PTSD um, because of all of the, the stress and the loss of people that they care for and that they care about. Um, I've seen our grocery store workers who have been pushed to the brink and worked so many extra hours, not to mention all of the healthcare workers on the front lines in our hospitals. And I always, my personal opinion was that this administration has been reckless and, and not particularly well informed. Um, I, I've never believed that they read all the briefings that they're supposed to read. But it's a whole nother thing to be reckless or, or ignorant than to be deceptive and to have American lives lost because of it. They knew, they didn't tell us. And I think the, the biggest enemy of the state right now is the misinformation that's coming out of the head of state. I think the biggest threat to the American people is the American president right now. And it's devastating, and I do not relish saying that. But the fact of the matter is, there's been so much more loss of life because we haven't had accurate, consistent 
medical information just coming out of the, the chief executive of our nation. Today, there will be some people gathering in Saginaw County, a county that we're watching very closely for the numbers of COVID. And the president, I know, is coming to town. And if the rallies are like those he's held in recent days in other states, there will be lots of people close together without masks on, projecting their voices. And I'm, I'm concerned about it. And this is not a partisan observation. We are in a public health crisis. We all want to get out of this public health crisis. And it's going to take every one of us doing the right things to get out of it together and to make this as short as possible. We will not be here forever. I'm hopeful it's a matter of months. I believe that to be the case. But every one of us has to do our part. And we have to be honest about how serious the situation is. Okay, Governor, the next question will come from Kim Russell with TV7 in Detroit. Hi, Governor. Everyone supports uh, giving opportunities to frontline workers, but one question I have is, is that money being taken from K-12 schools since it is education funding from the federal government at a time when we're seeing other frontline workers, our teachers in many cases being asked to take pay cuts? Well, actually, the dollars are, um, they are from the CARES Act funds. So this funds a full year. Um, this is, these are dollars that were set up for uh, the discretion, my discretion working with the legislature to further educational goals. So they're not coming out of the school aid fund. Um, they are dollars that are to be used to further our educational goals and create opportunities. And so it is a, a good way to supplement and encourage those who haven't finished their high school diplomas to do that, to get a certificate and a program or to get a degree. And, and that's uh, the intent of those dollars and that's what they're gonna be used for. Okay, Governor, the next question will come from Matt Price with TV6 in the UP. Uh, good morning, Governor. Uh, yesterday, you signed an executive order telling uh, high school fall athletes to wear masks while on the field or on the court during games, uh, just one week after giving fall sports the green light, especially contact sports like football. What prompted you uh, to make that decision yesterday? And as a second question, is it possible that we could see fans at, at your direction, see fans being allowed to attend high school sporting events at some capacity in the coming weeks and months, as long as they wear masks and socially distance? Yeah, I'm not surprised to get this question. I am glad you asked it because I know that it's on a number of people's minds. I'll just observe last week when we announced $5 billion investment in Michigan, I got five questions about high school football. Um, and I know that we are all passionate about sports. This is a part of who we are. It's a part of how we come together. It's how we support good, uh, healthy fun um, as an American pastime. And yet I know that um, it's important that we can engage in some of these things that make life feel a little more normal, but we still have to be very smart about it for our student athletes, for their families, for um, our educators. So every one of us has a duty to, to do our part to make sure we get this right. Masking up is an important part of functioning in the midst of COVID-19. And we know that in workplaces all across the country, people are masking up and they're able to re-engage the economy and stay safe doing that. We can re-engage in some of these other ways, but we have to do it, we have to be smart about it. And so there are a number of um, different uh, companies that are creating masks specifically designed to help athletes stay safe while they are um, running and, and blocking and um, playing football and, and other sports. And so we believe that this is one important way that we resume some football, but we got to do it with these protocols to keep people safe. And that's just really what it's all about. And same goes for anyone who is in the stands or taking part. Um, you know, we would, we still recognize that the more people that come together, the more people who are projecting their voices, uh, the, the more inherently risky the conduct is. And that's why we're, we're trying to do this and step into it and do it right. And, and hopefully we'll be successful, but we're counting on everyone to do their part. Okay, we'll take a few more questions. So the next one will come from Lauren Gibbons with I'm Live. 
Just a follow up on the high school athletes question. Um, are you concerned at all about um, local compliance, especially you know in uh, local football fields, or or just like I, I guess, are you concerned about compliance at all, or you know the potential safety aspect of of people exerting a lot of energy while wearing these masks? You know, we are seeing that this is becoming ubiquitous and it is happening. You know, we know that there are women who are in labor for 20 hours wearing a mask and that is some of the hardest work you can do, I know. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, you know, I don't, I don't want to make light of the necessity of mask wearing. It's really important and we want to, if we want to engage in football, we've got to be smart about it and we've got to protect our, our student athletes and our fans and our families alike. And that's why, you know, this, the, the ability to engage in these things is, is a, a part of our life that we can do if we continue to keep our numbers down and we continue to all do our part. And that's why, you know, I'm just going to sound like a broken record here, but the fact of the matter is we all have to continue to take this very seriously. And if uh, people drop their guard and we don't have compliance and numbers spike, we're going to have to take steps backward. And and I know none of us wants to, me especially. So we're, we're really imploring districts and leagues uh, coaches and families alike to ensure they do everything to keep the student athletes safe and encourage the behavior that'll do that. The next question will come from Zach Gorchow with Gombert. Good morning, Governor. I'm wondering uh, what your intentions are with the nursing home task force report that came out. Uh, last last week, or at least within the last several days, um, are you planning to uh, issue an executive order adopting those recommendations in whole or part? And how soon might we see a decision on that? So we're obviously familiarizing ourselves with the task force recommendations. We want to make sure that um, we are continually learning and getting smarter. I think that's the part of of this virus that we're learning more about the epidemiology of this virus. We're learning more about the transmission of this virus every single day. If you've studied the 1918 flu pandemic, you know that it it was such a huge threat to children. That's not the case in this one. Um, and so the smartest people in the world are learning an incredible amount every single day, and and we are we are learning as well. And so I think that this is one part of making better informed um, determinations as we continue to move forward. Dr. J, Anthony, you want to add? Okay, I'm going to let Dr. J step in. Oh, that's, that's a great question, and there are many people from the De Department of Health and Human Services who also participated on the task force. So right now we're looking at all of the recommendations. We're looking at how we can strengthen our current policies, improve them even more. Uh, things like visitation, uh, technical assistance, uh, providing uh, PPE and guidance. So we're looking at all of those recommendations, and we'll be providing more, more guidance and direction in the upcoming weeks. Okay, and the last question will come from Rob Maloney with TV4. Good morning, Governor. The World Health Organization website says that children should not wear a mask when playing sports or doing physical activities such as running, jumping, or playing on a play playground so that it doesn't compromise their breathing. The U.S. Volleyball's return to play guidelines recommend all attendees be required to wear face masks except for athletes on the court playing. The Cleveland Clinic says that running with a mask means that you should be looking out for chest pains, dizziness, lightheadedness, difficulty, or labored breathing. So knowing all of that, specifically what science or data are you using in requiring mask wearing for sports like football, volleyball, soccer in Michigan? Rod, I'm going to ask Dr. Jay to address your question. Thank you. So it's a, it's a great question. Let me also say I'm a former college athlete. My three children are also athletes, so th this is not something that we take lightly. I can say, um, of course, I've, I've looked at the WHO website. Uh, we understand that wearing a mask makes it less comfortable uh, to participate in a sport. We also understand there's some data, I would not say that it's proven, but there's some data that shows that the respiratory, the parameters, if you will, uh, trying to keep my language simple, but things like respiratory rate could potentially uh, increase if you're wearing a mask while exercising. 
but we do not have any proof that someone cannot exercise. And if they can't, quite frankly, then maybe they won't be able to participate, unfortunately, at this time. But for contact sports, it is recommended, given where we are with COVID-19 cases across the state, it is recommended to wear a mask. And if someone is unable to, then they may not be able to participate at this time. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. We've been listening to Governor Gretchen Whitmer giving the latest update here in the state of Michigan regarding the coronavirus outbreak. And so the big thing coming out of the um, out of today's press conference is the fact that the governor is launching the new First in the Nation Futures for Frontliners program to offer essential frontline workers a tuition-free path to community college. So what she's trying to do is reach out to those that have been on the front lines of this pandemic, still serving the community to offer them a brighter future. Some of the things that are going to be required for the program, applicants must be a Michigan resident, of course, have worked in an essential industry at least part-time for 11 of the 13 weeks between April 1st and June 30th, have been required by their job to work outside the home at least some of the time. They um, also uh, cannot have previously earned an associate or a bachelor's degree, not be in default of a federal student loan, and they have to complete the Futures of Frontliner scholarship application by December 31st. So uh, $24 million being dedicated to that effort. I will say this was somewhat of an odd um, to me, uh, she's talked about this before. So Tyler, I will say, listening to her broadcast as we've been sitting here doing, is n- not a lot coming out of this. A lot of the questions are directed towards her recent mandate regarding the uh, mask requirements for high school athletes. But she seems to dance around a lot of these issues. Your take? Yeah, I I was surprised that this was the big announcement with Futures for Frontliners. It's something that they had talked at length about in the previous months. I believe they announced it in April, and they did a full press conference explaining exactly what it was going to be about. There's documentation about it on the state of Michigan's website. So I was kind of surprised that of all the big announcements they had uh, reportedly had today that that is what that was. And and then the comments on high school sports, too, kind of surprised me, especially when uh, Rod Maloney from Channel 4 had had confronted the governor and Dr. Caldoun about the requirement to wear masks for all athletes uh, who are playing in contact sports, or really any sports, including contact sports like football, uh, based on the CDC's uh, recommendations, and that w- and those recommendations were kind of poo-pooed in this case, as opposed to being uh, supported or negated with facts and, and scientific information that the state has that maybe differs from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. So, a little bit odd, not in, not entirely reassuring on that front, but I mean, I, I guess we'll see what happens going forward with these high school sports, how these athletes react to the physicality of playing these high level these high level activity sports such as soccer and football and volleyball and and how that translates to their health in the games and and how mask wearing maybe translates to the spread or not spread of COVID-19 as a result. So, I mean, the jury's still out on this, but it it definitely is a little quizzical seeing them go against the recommendations of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in relation to mask wearing while playing sports. Yeah, as the the Lieutenant Governor indicated, today marks the six month mark since the first case to COVID-19 was uh, diagnosed here in the state of Michigan. And six months later, still trying to manage this pandemic, still so much news coming out of Lansing and the state of Michigan as we continue to try to navigate COVID-19. And if you head over to civiccentertv.com, we want to quickly try to bring you up to date on some of the other headlines that are making news at this point in time. Now, yesterday, uh, the vaccine will determine when a coronavirus restrictions 
are eased. Uh, Michigan's not going to soften its response to the coronavirus pandemic until a vaccine is produced and readily available. That's the message the governor delivered to the Detroit Regional Chamber yesterday. Whitmer said her plan works. The virus is slowing and Michigan's economy is at 87 percent of where it is in March. Again, no real mention of this, Tyler, and her press conference, but we've kind of seen that with her before and that she will have a press conference and stick to her topics, but then she'll make a decision and it will come out a day or two later in a press release. No mention of when movie theaters could possibly reopen during this time. Yeah, there's a lot left to be questioned with these decisions and the way that they are ad addressed. They, the, the state seems to be really keeping their cards close to, to their chest in the situation. And, and it's something I, I do question overall because I think the response has most of all been, uh, has mostly been justified, but that the openness to the government decisions to the general public has been lacking in, in many situations. But according to a new poll by the Detroit News and WDIV, a majority of Michigan voters approve of the governor's handling of the coronavirus pandemic. 600 voters across the state, so all different regions, surveyed at the beginning of September. 59% said they approve of her job performance, including a large share of the independent and black voters. Key demographic for the November election 38% of the voters disapproved. Prior to the pandemic, though, Whitmer had a 43% approval rating. So polls are just that, a snapshot in time, and there is a margin of error there, but still a large enough of a difference to show that of those surveyed, they think the governor is doing a good job. Yeah, and I think, that, I think that the way that Michigan stands right now against COVID-19, as opposed to many other states in the union, there hasn't been a major second wave in our state like there has been in many other states throughout the U.S., and I think that has a lot to do with the, with the poll numbers being so favorable for Governor Whitmer because her decisions have, put, have helped to put the state in a position to be where it is right now in regards to COVID-19, where other states have made other decisions that have led them to uh, some more sticky situations as of late. So those numbers don't entirely surprise me. But could those executive powers be coming to an end? Because the Michi uh, Michigan Supreme Court is hearing arguments right now on the governor's emergency powers. The debate over the governor's use of the emergency powers has landed in the Michigan Supreme Court. Justices heard arguments for about four hours Wednesday. More than 2,000 people at the end of the day still logged on to the Zoom conference listening to these arguments, which I find fascinating. And the, uh, the justice, uh, again, about four hours, at the root of the case, discrepancies between two different laws granting the governor emergency authority. A 1976 law includes a stipulation that the legislator approves state of emergency after 28 days, while the 1945 law doesn't set a time limit. They're saying that we understand there could be an emergency situation and that you couldn't get all of our elected leaders together in a timely manner to address an emergency situation. So therefore, the debate comes in and that 28 days is enough time to get our elected leaders back together to start voting on so many of these measures. However, other people are arguing on the governor's side saying, no, this pandemic continues on. I'm in the right authority to make these decisions in the interest of public safety. And we cannot have politics involved. Yeah, and previously when this was in the Michigan Court of Appeals, the, the court had ruled in favor of the 1945 act and said that the governor was uh, within the rights of the of her powers within the law that of course is still being appealed as the governor continues to extend emergency the states of emergency continues uh, to extend the length of time that she can execute 
her executive powers and making decisions regarding the, the pandemic and regarding what is allowed and not allowed across the state. And that's where the disconnect comes is people believe that you know, we're six months into this now and, we're, and we still haven't had input from the legislature on whether or not we should still be in a state of emergency, whether or not the governor should be the one that decides A, B, and C regarding what reopens, how it reopens, what regulations are in place. So this is going to continue to be a really a really back and forth debate in the state until it goes through the Michigan State Supreme Court and it could even go further. So uh, we're just getting started here on the Oakland County Megacast. We thank all of you for staying with us here for a little bit of an unusual uh, Megacast. But one of the things that we do here each and every day is try to bring you the very latest information. And that's why we go ahead and we take the governor's press conferences live. We'll have the full press conference up a little bit later this afternoon. So in case you missed it or if you want to dip in on some of the things that were discussed, during the press conference we'll have that up for you uh today again this is the oakland county mega cast you can catch us monday through friday 10 a.m to noon live on civiccentertv.com birmingham area municipal access catch us on the radio 89.3 lakes fm and 88.1 fm the biff 89.3 wbld orchard lake Sylvan Lake here in Kegel Harbor and 88.1 WBFH, Bloomfield Hills. We're going to take a quick break here. We're just coming up on the 11 o'clock hour. We'll take a quick break, and then we'll continue on with our regular uh, Oakland County Megacast. A lot of people to talk to today as we continue to navigate COVID-19 and the coronavirus pandemic. Michigan, the coronavirus pandemic has put us all to the test, and now... It's time to put COVID-19 to the test. As we move forward, testing will be critical. We encourage anyone who has reason to get tested to do so, those with symptoms and those without. If you are leaving home and going back to work, get tested. If you think you may have COVID-19 or you've been exposed recently through family, friends, or coworkers, get tested. Our test locator tool can help you find the right testing site that fits your needs. Even if you're looking for easy access with no cost, no prescription, and no appointment necessary, we've got you covered. Help Michigan move forward, not backward. To find a testing site or learn more, visit michigan.gov slash coronavirus test. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Michigan, we still need to stay careful because we don't want to go backwards, back to where we started. So keep standing six feet apart, keep wearing a mask in public, and if you have symptoms, talk to a healthcare provider about getting tested. To move forward, let's all do our part. So stay careful, michigan.gov slash coronavirus. Thank you for being with us on the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Ronnie Dahl alongside Tyler Keith as we work each and every day to bring you the latest information on COVID-19. As the Lieutenant Governor just mentioned, today we hit the six month mark, a milestone of COVID-19 here in the state of Michigan after the first case was identified. And six months later, we are still trying to navigate this pandemic and so many industries especially our our small businesses have been hit especially hard by the pandemic to get a take on what it's like we want to bring in blake kish he is a professional ballroom instructor with birmingham ballroom Uh, blake thanks for uh, taking time out of your schedule to be with us here on the oakland county megacast That looks like Blake is muted at the moment. It's, it's hey, Blake, can you unmute your uh, microphone? So we're all learning to navigate uh, the Zoom. <laughs> I've done this so many times, Tyler, too, just so you know, by the way. Uh, so as we continue to, to navigate Zoom, we are all making these uh, little mistakes. So we're trying to get Blake's audio here. Is looks he like good to go? Have him. Looks hey, like Blake, how are you? I'm great. How are you? Oh, we're great. It's it's great to be able to uh, have you here on the show. How are you doing? 
I'm good, but I'm going to need about three or four hours to complain in person. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll give you about uh, 20 minutes. How's that? <laughs> I, I, I know. I, I'm, I'm teasing. Uh, what an incredibly hard time. So I was just telling Tyler that at one time I, I participated in a Dancing with the Stars event for uh, Faith in Action here in Oakland County. And it's ballroom yeah. dancing, and you have to be one on one. You have to touch the other person. How is your industry doing right now? It's dead. It it died, and it's uh, it's very interesting. I was at a dance competition, and I came home, and we just got a new baby boy. And I went to Sam's Club to get some diapers because we were running low. And I got there, and there were no diapers, no toilet paper, no Kleenex. There's no meat in the counters. And I'm I'm taking pictures, sending them home, going, "What is going on?" I had no idea, because media wasn't telling us, "Watch out, this is going to happen." And so I come home from a competition and it, I was oblivious and it's get locked up. You're not going anywhere. Six months later, where are you today? The well, a dance studio is considered a dance space. And of course, by our governor is still closed. Um, besides the fact that I personally have had six immediate family members pass directly from COVID. So I'm not in a hurry to jump in dance position with someone. Well, you know, like you said, to you on your and your family, it's it's hard to lose people. So you have a bit of a different perspective then. I have a 40 year old cousin who was perfectly healthy that passed two weeks later. Dad, who's 83, got it and he survived it and he's fine. So, you know, the, the virus doesn't choose the elderly. It doesn't choose a 50 year old, a perfectly healthy 40 year old cousin of mine passed. And there, you know, it's just shocking to me. So, but like you said, the dance world, if you were with your, your partner, I have to hold you in dance position and show you or bring to your attention what you should be feeling. And then I have to turn around and take the leader and show them how to guide the person. So it's a one-on-one -on -one contact sport. And I tried to relate, and I, I was thinking, you know, like a massage, the, the person who's getting the massage doesn't touch back. You're still in the, in the space zone. Um, which would make me very uncomfortable. But dancing is where both people are interactive back and forth, and it's just, it's too risky. So we have seen with other dancers, we've been talking to them about how they're trying to navigate this, because for some people, dance is an expression of who they are, and they need to dance to feel alive. So even if they're doing it individually, where do you stand on those things? Is your studio back open or not? Because we are all one-on-one -on -one contact, we are closed. Like we don't do group classes. We don't, you know, have where um, conceivably if you had a jazz studio or a modern studio, you could put people six feet apart. You could space out your, your, your studio. You could make available masks and, and um, you know, sanitizers and things like that. And it can be done for that kind of an activity because ballroom is body to body contact. It's not the same. So, so how long do you think you could survive being closed? Well, I can't. And what's funny is I applied for a small business disaster loan and the government says that I have not proven that I've been affected by the virus. So not being able to work, I mean, how much more being completely shut down and frozen, what more can you prove, you know? I don't see it opening until until there's a treatment method or a, a vaccination of some sort. The, the nature of our industry is too, too close. So we are speaking with Blake Kish. He is a professional ballroom instructor with Birmingham Ballroom. Your business so directly impacted are you trying to survive with lessons virtually or online we've seen other companies try that i have talked to my client base and it's not the same like you said dance is a form of expression when you did dancing with the stars you laughed you guys joked you made mistakes Ballroom dancing is so much more than learning a box step. You can go to the internet, you can get a video for free, and you can do it on your own. That's not the nature of our business. It's very emotional. It's very much about expression and art. 
and it's about feeling joy and laughter and, and the expression that doesn't come from a box. So to put that on a video and say, watch me and you're going to feel amazing when you're done doesn't really work that way. I'm wondering, how are you surviving right now? What does your future look like? It's very scary. And because I'm an independent contractor, of course, you qualify for $160 a week unemployment. And for a family of four, that's pretty tough stuff. Um, but in the dance industry, there are people that are trying to, to function. They're, they're attempting to run things. And it's difficult, you know. I, I'm taking advantage of the time to raise two beautiful children, so I'm, I'm very happy with the babies. Um, I, for the first time, have spent every day with a, a newborn for the past eight months. You know, I've never done that before, so the, there's a reward at the end of the rainbow. Um, but on the other hand, yeah, the financial future looks really, really tough for well, us. I, I will say, uh, financial future aside, you're probably getting really good at being a, a daddy that's good with diapers, right? I'm telling you, Jesus, crazy. I literally was, I just stopped um, building a set of shelves for our baby Tyke's closet so that he'll have room for toys and books and stuff as he grows up. Blake, I would never have time to do that. Go ahead. Blake Kish joined us. He is a professional ballroom instructor at Birmingham Ballroom with us on the Oakland County Megacast. Also looking into the future, how do you see the interest in ballroom dancing being impacted by this shutdown, people are not able. People are going by the studio, and they're seeing that it's closed, and that, and they're, maybe they're looking up what, how they can get involved in ballroom dancing in the local area, and seeing that many opportunities are simply not there because of COVID-19. What do you think the lasting impact will be on this art, on this craft, and and on this interest of people uh, as an activity? In one word, devastation. Period. Um, I will say this: I've had two phone calls. For you know, a couple of people, a guy and a girl, each called and said that you know, are you guys open for dance lessons? Uh, the girl was for a wedding dance, and I do have a plan in place where we can get uh, partitions, plastic partitions on wheels that can divide the ballroom into three sections, so three teachers could be teaching at one time. You know, you have to wear your mask, you have to have the sanitizers, you have to spray down the tables and chairs in between clients. It's possible to make it happen. The thing is, is, you know, as to where normally I would have five people a week want to schedule, you call in to, to get information. I've had two in seven months. So that tells you right there that nobody's jumping to get into dance position. Yeah, you know, Blake, we're not really hearing a lot from the dance community. We have talked with owners of other dance studios, but they were more group studio so when you come to ballroom dancing and it is so intimate there is a different uh level of uh touching that you have to be concerned of is there a way for you to possibly offer private lessons like you said for for the wedding dance or couples that live in the same household um because we are still doing things such as you know going into grocery stores and we're still touching people and getting our hair done and things of that nature what are your thoughts on that and do you think that you should be open right now i personally am you know afraid to be open for my for my own health i went to paris last year and picked up a bacteria in june and i was on my deathbed so you know, getting the uh, the chance of getting it in my lungs again is not safe for me personally. Um, could it be done? When the governor says that we can open, I will put the petitions in place and there will be instructors that, you know, they're, they're the rugged ones, they're ready to go, that will figure out how to teach, maybe just by standing in front of them and, and showing them the steps. It's not going to be the same product. It's not going to feel the same. You're not going to receive the same um, enjoyment until it's safe to get back into dance position again. It's a long-term impact for our industry. So, I have many clients that are all working from home, and they're perfectly fine. It doesn't fall that way in our, in our profession. Yeah, you hear all of these things, and I would imagine listening to the news is hard for you. Because you are hearing that, oh, there's so many remote, you know, people working and this, that, and the other, and that's not a possibility for your industry. 
When you hear that the governor is basically saying we're not going to reopen fully until there is a vaccine and not only a vaccine, but until one is widely available, what goes through your mind? Are you looking at changing careers? Well, I'm 54. That's not going to happen. What is my thought pattern? That she is a very strong woman and I respect her decision and she's guided our state quite well in comparison to other governors that were frivolous and many, many people, way more people than our state were infected. So I respect her position. I thought about going into real estate. You know, I thought about there's there's got to be some other things that i can do because the long-term effect on the ballroom world is it's going to be a long term that's it so you know i really don't know it's uh it's it's a day by day thing and we just wait and see how it goes i believe that you know scientists are amazing and uh, that there will be something that will come up as far as a treatment proven treatment method or cure or vaccination and then we'll all be able to go back to a safe life Yeah, one of the good things coming out of this is we are seeing so many of our scientists and researchers from across the globe working together to try to come up with a vaccine and a solution to this pandemic. But in the meantime, you are where you are. How are you getting through each day and how much longer do you think you can go? Very good question, right? The thing that I find amazing is that the state of Michigan has programs that are just amazing to help people who want to take the time to find out what's available. And, And we're okay. The bills are paid. We're okay. You know, I'm, I, I thank God that, that, you know, Michigan has what it has available to its, its people. Um, long term, how long can we hold on? I don't know. That's it's just an unknown question, an unknown answer. So I will ask, um, when you say there are a lot of programs available, what's it been like for you to try to find those programs, apply for them, and then actually get the resources that you need from them? Well, as an independent contractor, and most dance instructors are, um, if you become unemployed because of something like this, um, it's very difficult monetarily wise. So you're not going to get a lot of help. But through, you know, asking questions, talking to people, um, there are ways to, to receive help. Like I got a $25 coupon for a farmer's market and I went and got a ton of uh, vegetables for the kids. So, you know, I mean, there are things, there's just, there are programs out there that are available. And those just little, have to take time yeah, and sometimes those little blessings that before we would have maybe have ignored now mean something, right? So exactly, exactly. So, like um, we're foster parents, and the foster program has something called WIC, and I, I forget what it stands for: Women, Infant, and Children. And we've never used it, and I've been a foster parent um, uh, for eighteen years, I think, and never have I used the WIC program because I figure there's people out there in need. They need it. We don't. I have a good job. You know, everything's great. But being unemployed, I have been using the WIC for the last five months because now I'm the person who's in need, you know, and and luckily there is a program there like that to help out. So I didn't use it when I didn't need it because I was fine. And now because I'm not working, I'm using it and it's there for the people that need it. So it's great. One of the things this has taught us is to swallow our pride and reach out to people for help and to learn what is really important to all of us. Hey, uh, Blake, uh, just uh, about 30 more seconds here with you on the Oakland County Megacast. Anything that we didn't touch on that you want to let people know or even your clients about the future of your industry? that I will give them the biggest hug as soon as it's a responsible thing to do. I miss everybody. Um, I love dancing. I've done it for 36 years. It's all I know. And, and I can't wait to get back on the floor safely and, and laugh again with everyone. 
Oh, that's my myth. I will say, I think we all miss hugging people, right? <laughs> so <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Blake Kish with us here on the Oakland County Megacast. He's a professional ballroom instructor with Birmingham Ballroom. We appreciate your time. We're going to take a quick break here on the Oakland County Megacast. And when we come back, we are going to talk with Dave Scott. He's the general manager here at CivicCenterTV.com and 89.3 Lakes FM. This has been a crazy time for him as well, not only here at the studio, but also with his business as well. So we'll get a little bit of insight from Dave when we return on the Oakland County Megacast. Hi, I'm Dr. Faust, the medical director for the Oakland County Health Division. The most important thing you can do to prevent the spread of illness is to wash your hands thoroughly and often. Follow these six easy steps every time you wash your hands. Step one, turn on the sink and wet your hands with warm water. Step two, apply soap to your hands and lather between your fingers, under your nails, and the front and back of your hands and wrists. Step three, wash your hands by scrubbing them together for at least 20 seconds. Step four, rinse your hands with warm, clean water. And step five, dry your hands with a clean cloth towel, a paper towel, or hot air blow dryer. If you're using a cloth towel, make sure to change it often. For handheld faucets, turn off the water using a paper towel instead of your bare hand. Step six, if you're using a paper towel, throw it away. Practice healthy habits like washing your hands after coughing or sneezing into them to keep you and others healthy. Go to oakgov.com health or call Nurse on Call at 1-800-848-5533 to learn more. Michigan, the coronavirus pandemic has put us all to the test. And now it's time to put COVID-19 to the test. As we move forward, testing will be critical. We encourage anyone who has reason to get tested to do so. Those with symptoms and those without. If you are leaving home and going back to work, get tested. If you think you may have COVID-19 or you've been exposed recently through family, friends, or coworkers, get tested. Our test locator tool can help you find the right testing site that fits your needs. Even if you're looking for easy access with no cost, no prescription, and no appointment necessary, we've got you covered. Help Michigan move forward, not backward. To find a testing site or learn more, visit michigan.gov slash coronavirus test. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Thank you for tuning in to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Ronnie Dahl alongside the one, the only, Tyler Keith. Here in our West Bloomfield studios. For those of you just tuning in for the first time, although I'm sure many of you are already very familiar with the Oakland County Megacast because what started out way back in March, thinking that we were just going to bring you the latest news as we all continue to navigate the coronavirus pandemic is now turned into nearly six months. So you can catch us on civiccentertv.com, Birmingham Area Municipal Access, and always on the radio, 89.3 Lakes FM and 88.1 FM, The Beth. And I will say the mastermind behind the Megacast is the one, the only, Dave Scott, he's the general manager here at CivicCenterTV.com and 89.3 Lakes FM and also the man behind Motown Digital. Dave, thanks. We miss you here in the studio, I have to say. How are you? Ronnie, I got to tell you, I, I miss being there every day. It was the favorite part of my day. And uh, but it's really good to be here with you today and really good to be here to talk about some very good news. But before we get to that, I just want to let you know what a privilege it is to have a veteran broadcaster such as yourself um, in the chair there at the Megacast. And the tradition is being um, carried on very well. And, you know, you, you should know that I took a look at the metrics yesterday for the show and uh, the numbers keep going up and up and up through the roof. Over 50,000 people in the last couple of months have gone to the Civic Center TV website uh, to tune in specifically to you and Tyler and the Megacast. You guys are doing a great job. 
Well, I don't think it's really us. I think it's our guest that we're able to get on the show. Jake, Larry, and the entire team doing an amazing job getting everyone here to try to uh, come in and inform the public. Dave, you know, we talked before you even brought me on. The one thing I like about this is the fact that we are able to do long form interviews with so many people and and the public is getting them in its entirety because as a reporter you take snippets a sound bite is like eight to 12 seconds so you're taking a 20 30 minute interview and putting it down to 130 so in this regard this is really being transparent with the public and letting them know all the information that they need because six months into this we are still going i thought we would be over this by now but we're not but not only are we having to pivot the public is having to pivot this is impacting all of our lives how has it impacted you well um it's impacted me tremendously but let me just follow up to your comment quickly and let you know that um it is unusual what we do in the broadcasting space where everything is condensed down to short little sound bites. You know, as a television reporter, it's particularly acute in the radio broadcasting area. Um, you know, I talked to folks like Paul W. Smith and the few times I've run into him and talked to him about some of the radio efforts I've worked on over the years. He always says, well, you know, it's just you're, you guys are so lucky that you have a half an hour to talk to a guest and it, it lets us get out of the way and let our guests talk without having to interrupt them because we have an agenda or because uh, more importantly, we don't have the time. And when you get out of the way and you just let people talk, then you learn things that you wouldn't otherwise learn because people just get comfortable and they freelance and they, they're sharing their stories. And um, I really like the flow of that. Um, to your question, um, I, I've been very lucky. Uh, we've been doing some amazing things at Civic Center TV and with the Megacast, and then uh, Motown Digital, the company that I own that I'm in our offices in Troy today. Uh, we have become the state's leading producer of virtual conferences. So um, we're right in the middle of all of this, and uh, we're doing the best we can to help people um, get through this crisis as their lifestyles change a little bit at home, at work, and, and in the meeting world and convention world where I, where I uh, am busy when I'm not working on television. Dave, I have a question. Do you think virtual conferences are going to stick around post-pandemic? Uh, I appreciate you asking that. Um, I think what's going to happen is there's going to be an evolution. So first thing that happened after March, the last event we did in person was a huge event at uh, at TCF, the former Cobo Hall, uh, for Blue Cross Blue Shield and all organizations. It was their event the last day before everything was shut down. And we had another event, our, our State of the Communities in West Bloomfield, we did at Abbott with no one in the room. So uh, first thing that happened is the audiences went away and then the, the venues were completely shut down and we all started working at home. Um, over the past several months, we've introduced this concept called virtual conferences. And for a lot of people, it's been Zoom meetings and uh, on a municipal meeting front, that's been enormously helpful. Uh, if you have a proceeding in court, you might be doing it via Zoom. Uh, municipalities are conducting business. Schools are conducting business. Students are going to school versus these uh, using these toolkits. But the next level of all this is a thing called the virtual conference which is like a traditional conference. It's a multi-year, multi-faceted event. It all happens online with breakout rooms, general sessions, chat, video, expo halls, the whole thing. And and now we're implementing those because we're very limited in, about, uh, in the number of people we can get into rooms. But the next evolution of that is um, combining the two into what are called hybrid events where you might have some people on site and some people at home. And eventually we're gonna get closer to having more people in the rooms, but no, I, I think this technology is here with us. It's, it's gonna be uh, a change to our culture. Uh, people will be able to, who formerly had to go to the office, are gonna work at home. People who formerly traveled to meetings are gonna be able to conduct their meetings over the internet. But you know, people still wanna press the flesh, get together and shake hands. And I don't see that going away, but there's gonna be a virtual component to to interaction, human interaction going forward. 
Dave, transitioning back to some of what we're doing here, one of the hallmarks of our operation in the fall is coverage of high school football with West Bloomfield High School and their incredibly talented team over there. And unfortunately, we lost that season earlier on with a decision by the MHSAA, but some good news recently when they did reverse that decision and, and, uh, re and resume the regular season, which will begin next week. And uh, our high executive staff here at Civic Center TV and at the Greater West Bloomfield Cable Communications Commission has some uh, interesting new efforts that are coming into our coverage this year. Would you like to discuss that a little bit? Yeah, well, I just want to say one thing about this evolution. It took me totally by surprise. So I want you to know, Tyler, that uh, that interview that we did with Pat Watson, the superintendent of schools, former principal of West Bloomfield, now superintendent of schools in Bloomfield Hills, uh, the most prolific thing anyone has said to me in the last six months, and I say it every day to people as I quote Pat Watson, and I say, hope is not a plan. My staff is getting sick and tired of me saying yeah. that and quoting Pat. But um, it, it couldn't be more true with high school football. We had a plan. We were hoping for the best. Then we kind of thought the worst. And now, to the surprise and shock of everybody, the governor has cleared the way in the MHSAA, Michigan High School Athletic Association, has football approved. And it's starting next weekend. So um, the rules are really interesting. And actually, um, you're not going to be able to go to the high school football game at West Bloomfield High School on Orchard Lake Road unless you're a parent of one of the athletes. The athletes, a new rule came out. I'm sure you've already reported this. It says the athletes are going to have to wear masks for any interscholastic um, event with the exception of swimming. So uh, high school football and the other sports are going to be played with masks on. So we're going to have a bunch of masked football players on Friday nights um, for the next several weeks playing high school football and then an unusual twist in the season this year every team that participates will get into at least the first round of the tournament so we'll have at least seven games as you mentioned tyler west bloomfield has an amazing program we have a number of students that are going to big 10 universities that we didn't think we we're going to be able to watch play football their senior year and had they moved the season, the spring, we talked to Ron Bellamy, coach of the Lakers earlier, and he said we would have lost those seniors because come springtime, the seniors are already engaged in major Big Ten programs at Michigan, Michigan State, and, and other um, collegiate programs. So good news all the way around, except for the fact that the fans won't be able to be there in attendance. So the cable commission, Tyler, has given us instructions. They say, Dave, Tyler, Get out there and do those football games and put them on television. Put them on TV live. So the MHSAA, who traditionally, and I don't want to go down this path too far because it is a pretty one, have made it impossible for us to put these games on television live. However, they're out of the way. They want these games broadcast. They want people to see it. So the great news, Tyler, is you and I next Friday night are heading over to Oak Park. Should they welcome us and we'll do the game on the radio as we did all of our games last year and subsequent away games will at least be broadcast on the radio and all the home games from Orchard Lake Road and West Bloomfield High School, the home of the swamp will be live on television on Civic Center TV and WBTV and I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, it's going to be a, it's going to be a good season. Six game, six regular season games. Every team makes the playoffs. We're going to see a, I think we're going to see a lot more of the depth of the West Bloomfield Lakers team this year be playing as they adjust to this new schedule and they get everybody's uh, everybody's football legs back under them. And there's so much talent on this team. I mean, led of course by running back, wide receiver, wildcat quarterback. Just a, a flex player, Donovan Edwards, who's got national attention from Power 5 schools. A lot of veteran leadership coming back on the, the defensive side. Gavin Hardiman, Maxwell Hairston, who just committed to the University of Kentucky, are among some of the many players. And then uh, interior and intangible guys like uh, like their center, Caden Halliburton, guard Osian Harris, and then special teams, both their kicker, Jake, uh, Jake Ward, and their punter, Sammy Lafada are back this year as well. So a really solid team coming out for the Lakers. We are loaded, and by anyone's assessment, the West Bloomfield Lakers are clearly a team that not only can go all the way, is expected to go all the way. And the bugaboo the last couple of years, Tyler, you, know, you and I both broadcast heartbreaking games in Belleville as we couldn't get past our regional foe. Hopefully uh, the Lakers will get there, but 
with the shortened schedule and the opponents that just happen to line up, this is an unbelievable high school football season for the Lakers. Massively competitive. So even though we have a great team, this is not going to be a cakewalk. We start out at Oak Park, one of the best programs in all the state, um, next Friday night. Then Southfield A&T, an amazing program that continues to get better, especially as they combine the two Southfield schools. Clarkston, perennial state championship favorite. We're on the road up at Clarkston. And then this is kind of cool. We end the season with three home games. We have Oxford, Rochester, Adams, and then Lake Orion wrapping up the season. And Tyler, I think the most exciting game we had last year was Lake Orion, who when we faced them had not lost a game all season. It was a, a tough game. Lakers were down. They fought their way back. The rain and lightning came in and suspended the game. And it took two nights of football for the Lakers to escape with a victory over the then uh, a Lake Orion team that was undefeated. And uh, that set the way for a strong entry into the postseason and had a great season for the Lakers. But I think at, down to the individual man and, uh, and coach on that team, I think they were all disappointed that they couldn't get through the regional final. And uh, there's some scores to be settled, so it's going to be a fun year. It absolutely will. And a really tough schedule for the Lakers. Six, six matchups that could honestly go either way. It'll be an exciting football season. Dave, anything else for us today? No, I just want to let people know that the high school athletic association and the schools in the state have their own television network and games will be streaming it's a fee-based system and it uses a single camera at the high school and we could have just let that go and use that but um we decided and the cable commission um is providing us the support to broadcast these games with two cameras we're not you know i mean it, you know espn's not coming in to do the games i don't know we're gonna have a lot of technical things and replays and stuff but you're going to get an excellent view of the game produced up with our late live play by play and we're going to be streaming it for free it's going to be on civic center tv for free it's going to be all over Whoop, i don't see why we can't put it on facebook live for free not a penny and we just i hope you set up viewing parties around West Bloomfield because this could be the year in this COVID-19 year that the West Bloomfield Lakers go all the way and you're not going to want to miss a second. Absolutely, Dave. Must see TV and must see radio here in the West Bloomfield area watching Lake of Football, which returns next week, Friday, with our first matchup against the Oak Park Knights at Oak Park. That will be live right here on 89.3. Lakes FM. We thank Dave for joining us today. We're going to take a quick break and we'll come back and we'll talk about body language. So much different now that we're all in this virtual world and we have to navigate not only that, but how do we come off in a virtual sense to those that we are in school with, that we are going to work with, those that we're interviewing on a television show five days a week. We'll find that out next on the Oakland County Megacast. You're watching and listening to us on a variety of TV and radio and other media outlets. Michigan, we still need to stay careful because we don't want to go backwards, back to where we started. So keep standing six feet apart, keep wearing a mask in public, and if you have symptoms, talk to a healthcare provider about getting tested. To move forward, let's all do our part. So stay careful, michigan.gov slash coronavirus. Michigan, we're calling on you to save lives. Don't ignore it. Don't let it go to voicemail. It's urgent. In fact, it's critical. Because if you've been in close contact with someone who tests positive for COVID-19, you may have been exposed to the virus. And you could get a call from My COVID Help or your local health department. So please answer the call to learn how to protect yourself, your family, and friends. We're calling on you to stop the spread of COVID-19, to make it safe to reopen businesses and help Michigan move forward. So if you get a call from My COVID Help or your local health department, you may have been exposed to someone with COVID-19. To protect us all, answer the call. Learn more at michigan.gov slash contain COVID. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services.
Welcome back to the Oakland County Megacast. You can catch us on Civic Center TV, Birmingham Area Municipal Access, 89.3 Lakes FM and 88.1 FM, the BIF. If you do have cable TV still, I will say, uh, Tyler, we still have cable at my house, but we also yes, still have a landline. <laughs> so wow. that you're, I like, don't. you're like, that I don't have. Cable, <laughs> we yeah. do still have a landline. landline. I know, I know. I keep Bella. telling my husband to get rid of it. Uh, you can catch us on 89.3. Uh, but uh, no, on uh, if you have uh, cable, Channel 15 Comcast, Channel 99 on AT&T. I'm excited for you and Dave, though, to be able to bring high school football it, as long as it lasts. Hopefully it lasts this entire shortened season to all the parents and the grandparents and the brothers and sisters for them to be able to enjoy this sport. It's an unusual season, but I think it is a great service that you are providing uh, to all of the people here in this area. Yeah, and it gives these communities something to be looking forward to, um, something that's exciting that's going on. They can't necessarily be there, and it's not the same, but it's something that's resembling normality and normalcy in their lives and i think that that for the kids especially but also for the community is is something that uh, it's going to make this season that much more special it is so important um it, like you said it, it gives us a distraction yeah and i think so many people need a distraction right now but one of the things is while we're trying to be distracted we also have to be engaged but how do you be engaged with one another if they can't see you smiling under a mask. That's right. Uh, so we want to go ahead. Uh, we are joined today on the Oakland County Megacast with Monica Levine. She is a certified body language trainer and a nonverbal science. Monica, we all need you in our lives right now. How are you today? I'm so fantastic. It's so nice to be here. The way you, you're set up, I don't get to see you, so I can't read your body language. <laughs> That's okay. I don't have a mask and I am smiling. Okay, me me too. <laughs> and you can tell when someone is genuinely smiling because fake smiles don't reach the eyes. Real smiles reach the eyes. Oh, see, that's a good thing. Good so explain to us exactly about you and what you do. I teach audiences, groups, and individuals how to influence, positively influence, situations and people using nonverbal communication. And nonverbal communication is the art of intuition, mindset training, and the science of body language. All of that put together. Body language actually gives me a way so many times. I may be saying me one too. thing, but my face is saying another thing. Yes. And we get into bad habits. Like one time I was at the border crossing over and when they asked me the usual question, do you have any cigarettes, alcohol, guns and pepper spray? I'm shaking my head. Yes. As I'm saying, no, I don't. Well, of course, they didn't believe me. You may, maybe you know some people that do that. I have a friend and she always says, I'm so, so, so excited while she shakes her head side to side. I am so excited. So her body is saying no when she is saying yes. And that happened to me at the border. My mouth was saying, no, I don't have any cigarettes, alcohol, guns, and pepper spray. But my head was saying, yes, I do. So that did cause some confusion. Fortunately, they did not take my car apart. Well, that, that's good to hear. Monica Levine, certified body language tw trainer with non-verbal science with us on the Oakland County Megacast. It's different now or maybe it's even very similar now to in normal times, so to speak, in terms of body language, because we're all over virtual means. We're doing Zoom for a television interview. We're doing Zoom for classes, whether it be high school, middle school, elementary, college, whatever the case may be, and for our work every day as well. How does body language translate, or, or modifying your body language translate to the virtual sense so that you're giving off the same kind of positive feel that you want to in normal life, but over a virtual world where there are some key differences. I really encourage people to be intentional about their body language. 
So I do have a training on nonverbalscience.com. It's free. It's called Body Language for Video Conferencing. So anyone can go there and watch it. It's 30 minutes. Again, it's free. And today I want to tell you about something to me that's really huge. Because nonverbal communication is up to 93% of our communication. Not quite as high when we're over the telephone or when we can't see each other, like I can't see you right now but it is still very large and different parts of our brain process different kinds of information. The part of the brain that processes verbal information is different than the part that processes nonverbal. And the part that processes nonverbal, I like to call our primitive brain. It's that ancient part of us that's back in the cave, you know, afraid that someone's going to come in, bonk me on the head and steal my fire and my food. So it's that very primitive part of us. So when we're in person or on video screen, the thing that I want to see in order to relax is I want to be able to see your hands. Because if I can't see your hands, my primitive brain says, I don't know if that person can be trusted because they're coming towards me. I don't know if they're going to bonk me on the head and steal my fire and my food. So a lot of people, when they're on video chat, they put themselves much too close to the screen. So then the person that's viewing them cannot see their hands. But if you can see my hands, your subconscious mind, your primitive brain will relax. And then you can better absorb the information I'm giving you. So it's very important on video chat to back yourself up enough that the top of the screen is at the top of your head. And the bottom of the screen is around the bottom of your ribs. And so that when you gesture, it's obvious that your hands don't contain weapons. The other person can relax and you can bond more effectively. That is such a good tip. And I will say, because we do all of our interviews via Zoom, and even prior to this, uh, you know, as a reporter, we were doing interviews via Zoom. It has been, we see everything. We see everything. It's like the backdrop to to me is so important and the camera level as well. Right, you don't want the camera looking down on your nose or looking up your nose because research has found that when we view someone straight on, we assume that they are friendly, trustworthy and, and more intelligent. So we want the camera at eye height. And if I'm on a Zoom call with lots of people, I'm tempted to look at their photographs, right? But really, if I want to make a connection, I need to look at the camera because then you feel like you and I are connected. You feel like, oh, Monica, Monica Levin is looking at me. She's paying attention to me. I feel seen. But if I'm looking somewhere else, you don't feel like I am fully engaged with you. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm laughing. So when we first started Virtual World, I was obsessed with backdrops in everyone's homes can yes because i feel like it's a glimpse into their life and their personality but sometimes too it was too busy and that i wasn't paying attention to what they were saying i was looking into what was behind them and even more so when their camera on their computer wasn't positioned correctly because i couldn't get the sense of who they were. That's also because you're like most of us, we're curious. A friend of mine who's a photographer asked me once, he said, what is the important element in a photograph? Well, I didn't know. He said, every element in a photograph is important and every element that's in your video screen is important. So do I have dirty laundry in the background? No, I try not to. I also don't have pictures of my family because you're curious, or I'm curious. If you had pictures of your family, I would be trying to figure out who's the spouse, who's the kid, well, who's that one in the corner, and I'm not paying attention to you. And if you have books in the background, I'm curious. I want to see what you're reading, right? Unless you have books that you wrote, and you have them in the background, and you want them to be part of your persona. So I choose my background, usually when I do my virtual workshops, I stand so that I feel more confident. And then the top part of me has the white backdrop and it's a different angle than what I show here. And I have this photo on the side and I try and wear a bright color 
so that your eyes come to me. Your eyes say, there's Monica Levin. And you're not trying to figure out what the picture is. It just looks like a bunch of colors. So even here, I have plants. It's neutral. And I try to be intentional about it. As you watch movies, you probably notice, like me, you're saying there are a lot of Apple computers in movies. That's intentional. When someone pulls out cereal, probably cereal manufacturers are paying to have their cereal in the movies. Everything that's in the screen is important. And I tried to have a virtual backdrop at one point, but my hair was a bit longer and really curly, and it just looked like I had a green halo. And even with those virtual backdrops, sometimes your arm will disappear <laughs> or your face will disappear. So I recommend just using a regular backdrop and the simpler, the better, like you were saying. I just had this conversation with my husband yesterday because he had to change the backdrop uh, because our office flooded upstairs, downstairs. So we had to move him up into the bait or up into the bedroom. And I'm like, oh. your backdrop is too busy. Take that, that and that away. And he's like, no, I want that. I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm when I'm distracted, I'm not paying attention. But I love your tip about wearing a bright color. But mm -hmm. that's great when we're virtual. But what tips do you give us if we're in person and we're in a mask? In person in a mask, first of all, number one, give yourself a break. Because research has uh, tracked people's eye patterns, meaning where they look, in different situations. When we are in high power business situations, our tendency is to look at the other person's eyes and up to their forehead. In your, when you're in a social situation, people's eyes track between the other person's eyes and down to their mouth. And in an intimate situation, like you and your husband, when you're alone, the kids are out, you're having a glass of wine, you track between the eyes and down to the suprasternal notch, which is essentially where your, your shirt closes, right? And when we're wearing masks, we want to feel connected. We want to feel uh, friendly. And so our tendency would be to social gaze, which is between the eyes and down to the mouth. And it gets very disconcerting because we can't see people's mouths, right? So give yourself a break. Know that that's what's happening. Your subconscious mind is feeling uneasy because you want to be friendly. You want to be social, but your eyes are tracking up between the other person's eyes and their forehead. So you feel more distant. You feel more businesslike because the body and the mind and the emotions are all connected. One woman that I saw in a meeting, she had painted a smile on her mask. I thought that was lovely because then when you do your social gazing, you're looking between the eyes and down to her mouth and you can see her mouth smiling, even though it's painted on. And it just created a little bit of relief and really made me realize how much my default gaze is social gazing. I like to connect with people by looking between their eyes and down to their mouth. So when I feel uncomfortable, I just need to be easy on myself and recognize that that's why. Kind of talk to my subconscious mind. Monica, it's okay. You can still be friendly. <laughs> and we can see most of the seven universal micro expressions just by looking at the bridge of the nose and the eyes. We can see true happiness. We can see sadness. We can see anger. We can see disgust. Uh, we can see, yeah, true happiness. So most of the expressions we can see from there, but it's this emotional response to not being able to see their face, their mouths. So just recognize that that's a normal response to not being able to see the mouth. And it's the subconscious mind, your primitive brain that is creating this emotion in you. Monica Levin with us. She is a certified body language trainer at Nonverbal Science, joining us today on the Oakland County MAGAcast. And, and Monica, earlier you talked about uh, the importance of smiling and, and genuine smiling when you're in a virtual sense and, and how you can tell the difference between someone's genuine smile and their not-so-genuine smile but for some people this is a really stressful time this is a time where they got a lot going on but they need to be professional they need to be cordial they need to be friendly in a professional sense in an educational sense if they're virtual learning or if they're a virtual teacher how do you what do you suggest for them in order to maintain a friendly a friendly demeanor and a professional demeanor in a virtual sense with all that's going on in the world behind them without it coming off as being fake well, 
Only genuine smiles, of course. And if you want to reduce your stress, because we're feeling uneasy, you can do what's called power posing. And I cover this in the free workshop that I have on nonverbalscience.com, the free workshop called Body Language for Video Conferencing. It's to prepare yourself before you present, before you negotiate, before you teach, is to stand in a high power position, like a Wonder Woman, Superman position with your chest up, your shoulders down, breathe down into your belly. Imagine that you have roots going down into the earth from your feet. So you calm down your fight or flight instincts, right? If we start to breathe up in the top of our chests, we're signaling that we're ready to fight or fly, fight, fight or flight. So breathe down into your belly to relax yourself so that you can stay open and genuine. And to be open to ideas, you keep your body open because the body, the mind and the emotions are all connected. If you start crossing your arms in front of you, your primitive brain, the part that's in the back in the cave, worried about your food and your fire, right? Your primitive brain says, I don't feel confident. I don't feel safe. Because when we don't feel safe, we cover our vulnerable organs because we're trying to protect ourselves. And science has shown that when we cross our arms or block our bodies or block our mouths or our eyes, we actually don't absorb information as easily. When I'm taking an online class, I make sure to keep my arms open so that information can literally reach me, whether it's to my body, again, connected to my mind and my emotions. So calm yourself down with power posing, keep your feet on the ground. And when you get a little nervous or uncomfortable, wiggle your feet, imagine roots going down into the earth and keep your body open so you can absorb information. Monica Levine with a certified body language trainer, nonverbal science. Such good information that you are giving us right now. I think so many of us don't pay enough attention to our body language. I'm a hand talker and I'm a hugger, which has been really hard during this pandemic. And I love meeting strangers. And you can't like, I think when you're trying to meet a stranger, it's hard to to cross that barrier but i will say when you're talking about non-verbal and let's say you do have a virtual presentation or a virtual meeting would you recommend people record themselves prior just to understand some of the movements that they are making that maybe they don't even understand that they're doing becoming conscious of it is a good step and if anyone needs help with that, they can call me and we can go through the presentation together. Because sometimes when you look at yourself, you get so hard on yourself and you don't even give yourself a break. But if you, for example, need to give a presentation and you know the words, you've written all the words, I can help you determine what nonverbal signals you can use. For example, if you have two things you're covering, you can show people that you have two. If you're talking about a choice between two objects, choice A and choice B, then you can have your gestures help tell your story because you want to engage the other person's full brain. And if up to 93% of their brain is occupied interpreting your nonverbal, if you have no nonverbal, they can get distracted. So you want to keep their attention by using gestures and head tilting and leaning and eyebrow raises, etc., so that you can get your point across. So over exaggerate your movements. Good tips there. I will say in one way this has helped me out because the other day at the grocery store I had to have my mask on and someone was being let's just say not polite and I may have stuck my tongue out at them through my mask and they never saw me. <laughs> well, that's handy that way. <laughs> okay, so I'm going back to being a second grader. <laughs> I can't help yeah. it, but I but I took advantage of being able to wear a mask. Obviously, if I didn't have the mask on, I never would have done that. Uh, but just about thirty. But they might have read your body language anyway. <laughs> oh. You might you might have closed your body, leaned back, turned away, and stuck out your tongue. <laughs> right? Maybe. Division. I will say it wasn't. Uh, uh, 
it wasn't directed to me. It was how they were interacting with someone else in which I did that. So I thought they were being rude to another person that wasn't even my uh, story to even tell. At any rate, we have about 30 seconds left with you. You've already offered so many great tips. Uh, Monica Levine with a certified body language trainer, nonverbal science any last words you want to give to our listeners and our viewers? And also, where can they contact you? You go to nonverbalscience.com. I am here in Michigan, so contact me through there. And I have a library on there with lots of tips, short little videos, just two minutes long, short videos that explain different body language um, tips and theories that you can use. I also have the free training and you can contact me to train your sales teams, leadership teams, or customer service teams. Monica, we thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to be with us today on the Oakland County Megacast. We so appreciate it. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. Some great tips there, uh, Tyler, from Monica Levine, certified Absolutely. body language trainer, nonverbal science. Tyler, I promise I'm not going to stick my tongue out at you. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> mask or no mask. Uh, just uh, a few seconds here. We're wrapping up on the Oakland County Megacast. Thank you to everyone who tuned in to us for this shortened version of the Megacast. Thank you to Larry and Jake and Tyler and the entire team. And always check us out on civiccentertv.com for all editions of the Megacast.